Hello! Welcome to Netcast Church Sermon Podcast. We exist to tell people about Jesus and connect them to the church. If you'd like to know more, visit netcastchurch.org. Enjoy! So, uh, those who don't know, my name is Matt Tuning. I'm one of the pastors here, and, uh, oh, I'm getting some love in it. <laughs> and uh, it's, been, it's been a wild couple weeks. I mean, like, we've, as a church, there's just been so much going on. We did Discover a few weeks ago. We had, all like, probably 70 people were at that, and uh, people getting connected to our church. Then last week was Easter Sunday, uh, and before that, we did this thing on Good Friday. It's just been nonstop for us. Uh, but it's, it's been a beautiful thing for us as a church. It's been a beautiful season for us. We're growing like crazy. It's obviously packed in here today. Uh, we had 900 plus people, almost 1,000 people actually, uh, that joined us for Easter Sunday, which is, a, that's the most we've ever had at one service ever or one, in one day. Uh, and so the church is really growing, which is kind of cool uh, to see that. Um, obviously, we're not just about butts in seats. The fact that you're here, I think that that's great. That's awesome. But if we are not desperately passionate about seeing people not just show up uh, on a Sunday, but be discipled and to be challenged in their faith with Jesus and to, uh, like, then we're failing as a church. And so don't see numerical growth uh, as, as the end all be all to success as a church. Fruitfulness is what we're going for. Okay, we're going for fruitfulness. We want to see people more loving, more joyful, more worshipful, more, more about Christ than they were the day before as he provides for us new mercies every single day. Okay, we should clap for that because that's what it's about. Um, and so, uh, so, so uh, today is a fantastic day. It's uh, Baptism Sunday. Uh, I, I remember, so I became a Christian when I was uh, a freshman in college. I was 17 years old. I grew up in a home where my dad was a bad Catholic and my mom was a bad Jew, which just created a bad, confused person, uh, if you, you can imagine. And so uh, it wasn't until I wound up in college and um, uh, a buddy of mine by the name of Ricky Grant, uh, I had some questions for him and I was like, yo, what is this whole thing? Like people like, talk, like Christian thing. I, there's a bunch of Christian people at this school. I went to a small school called Eastern Nazarene College in Quincy, Mass. And, uh, and he like explained the, the gospel message that one day I'm going to stand before a holy God and give an account for my life. And regardless of what I say that day, right, God knows who I am. And, and knowing who I am, he knows my flaws. He knows the good moments that I've had and the bad moments that I had. But sin has separated me from God. And, and uh, so God sent his son Jesus to live the life that I couldn't, perfect in all of his ways, die the death that I deserve, and then rise in victory over Satan, sin, and death itself. And that something spiritual on the cross happens where God exchanges his life, or Jesus exchanges his life for mine. He takes the weight of sin on himself and extends to me new life as I put my faith and trust in him. And I'll never forget, the guy was like, that's the message of Christianity. Like, it's not about being good or anything like that. It's about being in a relationship with this God. And he was like, do you believe that? And I was like, yeah. He was like, really? I was like, yeah, I don't know why, but I'm like in. I'm like, I believe that. And it shocked me as much as it did him, right? I was like, I don't even know why. And, and if you're a Christian in the room and you follow Jesus, you know that that's true about you. It wasn't like you woke up one day and you're like, one plus one equals two? Jesus, right? You were like, it wasn't like a logical, analytical thing. It was like you, most of us, right, we've come to this conclusion because something was birthed inside of us and it was like our eyes became open. We were once blind and now we see. And so, and, and so like if you're here looking for all of your answers or to, your, to all of your questions, listen, I'm not going to be able to and we're not going to be able to provide that. We're talking about a God. Yeah. Like we're talking about the one true only God. If you put him in a box in which you could fully understand him, he's not God. Okay? And so he's, we've got to take him outside of that box and say, there is an element of putting my trust in that in which I don't fully understand. What I do understand is that Jesus was a real person who claimed to be God, lived a great life. Everyone around him said there was no deceit in him, right? Healed the sick, told the wind to shut up and slow down, and it listened, and, and then died, and then comes back to life. And so, like, I put my hope in a dude who came back to life, because I ain't yeah. never seen that before. And Woo! until there's another one that you can provide to me that says, like, well, he came back from the dead, too, and claimed to be God, and, for, and then, like, cool, we'll have to deal with that. But until then, there's only been one, mm. and his name is Jesus, okay? And so, anyway, so... So th this, is, this is what makes today so amazing is because we're celebrating people who have like given their life to this Jesus and it says that he takes what was dead and makes it alive. He takes a heart that was a heart of stone and he turns it soft into flesh and he begins to transform people from the inside out. 
Like, not the outside in. No one gives a rip at how great your outfit is today. The outside doesn't matter to God. It doesn't. It's what's going on inside here, right? And if you're a person that puts more stock in the outward appearance of a person than the inward, than the inward person, right, then I don't know what you mean when you say, like, that matters. Because it doesn't. It doesn't. And so, Jesus, th- this is what we're about. So, anyway, uh, it's been a long, it's been a so I just, that, none of that was in my notes. I just wanted to just tell you that. I don't, I just wanted to tell you. So, th- this week has been so interesting. So, on Friday night, I did, uh, I had the privilege of doing a wedding, officiating we- a wedding for some friends of mine in the Cape. And uh, one of my favorite parts of weddings that I do uh, is a ring ceremony. I always do a ring ceremony. Not all pastors do a ring cer- ceremony. A lot of people do. Uh, and so, um, but, but I literally have like a portion of my, uh, of my entire wedding ceremony and like dedicated to the ring component. So, so the ring ceremony is this portion of the wedding where uh, it takes place after they've already said their vows. So for all intents and purposes, uh, the couple is already married. God has already mysteriously and supernaturally taken two individuals and joined them together as one flesh. I just haven't yet pronounced them husband and wife. And, 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 and so I do this ring ceremony at the very end. And, uh, and w- when a lot of pastors do a ring ceremony they usually will make a big deal about like the ring and they'll pull out the ring and they'll be like this is a ring and the ring is a circle and the circle resembles the endless eternal love of God that has no beginning and no end similar to how your love for one another will have no beginning and no all that's stupid by the way (laughs) that is not true okay none of it's true it's made up it's not even a real thing like like the reason the ring is a circle is because your finger is circular and it and it needs to go on there that's the only reason that it's there right like like that the ring the ring is it's not some god god goes round and round with his love it's like the the gravitron at the ipswich fair right it's like like that's not what it is it's a ring because your finger's round okay and 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 so and so the ring and i tell them this at the wedding i literally say that i'm like the ring is it's it's a ring it's a symbol Okay, it's a metal symbol, and that symbol says, taken, okay, taken, period. So when my wife is out, and she's walking down the street, and she just happens to catch some dude's eye, okay, which has happened before, by the way, (laughs) the ring is like, belongs to Matt, belongs to Matt. Now, I know it's 2022. I don't belong to nobody. No man gonna own me. Okay. (laughs) Chill with all that. Okay, fine. Cool. You do you. You do marriage how you want to do it. You don't own me. Sure. Sure. That's my girl, and I'm her man, and this is the symbol that demonstrates that. But you do you. It's 2022. That should be a song, okay? <laughs> and, so, and so what it's saying is like, mine, taken. No need to introduce yourself. No need to like, hey, can I buy you a drink? None of that. No, you don't need to open the door for her. She's got someone that will do that, okay? Her allegiance is spoken for. Her allegiance is to me. And so, so what I do at these, at these uh, weddings, right, is I like have them partially put the ring on the finger and I have them do like a repeat after me of promises. I promise to be approachable. You've got to remember these, right? Promise to pray for you and I promise to repair the relationship quickly when we fight because we will fight, all right? I, I promise to be faithful to you with my heart and my mind and my eyes and my hands and I will keep these promises for as long as we both shall ring. And then I tell them, all right, now lock it in. And they do it, lock it in, boom. And I'm like, treat it like an Amex car. Like, don't leave home without it. Keep that thing on. You want people to know you are taken, okay? And so, well, I say all that to say baptism Sunday and baptism in general is kind of like a ring ceremony. It's this outward expression. It's a symbol for all people to see of what has happened in your, in your heart, that, that God's allegiance is to you and your allegiance is to him. That if you believe in Jesus, God has made you one with him by his Holy Spirit. You've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And, and, and he's already done it, right? He's already supernaturally washed you and cleansed you and made you new. And getting in the tank doesn't wash off the sin like, ugh, get it. That's not it. He's done that through his blood. Baptism though is the symbol it's the demonstration of your allegiance to jesus and it symbolizes a reciprocation of his promises god's promises to you that he is with you everywhere you go he will never leave you nor forsake you he will use all evil against you for you right this is his promises to you that you are taken so when you come out that tank this is my allegiance to jesus and i'm showing the world okay it's supposed to be this moment that marks a person's, like, dare I say, marriage to Christ. 
He calls his church the bride of Christ. And if you're not married to Jesus, you're married to something. I mean, you should ask that question. What are you so committed to? And how is that treating you? How is that, like, how committed, here's what's so funny. We love in this world to be so committed to things that aren't committed to us. Oh, I'm just so committed to money. Money ain't committed to you. I'm so committed to my job. Man, they'll pink slip you quick, right? So if you're not married to Jesus, who are you married to? So um, after Jesus rises from the grave, which we celebrated last week, he then spends 40 days with his disciples. And just before he ascends to heaven, he tells, he tells them this. This is in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Jesus says this, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Jesus then says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. For whoever does not believe will be condemned. You have to understand, Jesus never understood a world where a person would claim to believe, but not make a public declaration about that belief. It'd be like a bride being like, you know what? Like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I promise a bunch of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'll be faithful, faithful. No, I'm not wearing a symbol that I'm yours. I'm not trying to show everybody that, like, it's like the hideaway husband. Yeah, 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 you know, like, at home, you know, it's just us. But, like, out in public, like, hmm. It, 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 it's like that. Baptism, it, it's not an emotional act of faith of any sort. Baptism, it's an act of obedience. It's, it's choosing to identify yourself as one with Christ. To not be baptized is to actively choose to not identify with Jesus. Just, we just got to own that, okay? All right? One of my beefs with the American church is that we have, we have, lo- we have like, we love to uh, adapt our, our lives. No, 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 I'll, I'll say it like this. We love to try to adapt Christ's call to our lives rather than our lives to Christ's call. We try to bring Christ in and like, oh, we're just going to sprinkle Christ a little bit into my, into my life. Rather than, this is, this is, my life is Christ. This, this is Jesus' words here in Luke. He makes it explicitly clear. He says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough money to complete it. Or what king, he says, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and then deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. So therefore, he says, anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You you have to understand, Jesus only understood a world where if you claim to follow him, that meant that you counted the cost, that you understood that it was going to be a war, and you willingly renounced everything to follow him. So, So part of the reason why I'm so passionate about baptism is because as people who are blessed to live in a place where there is freedom of religion, and I know it's like, oh no, you know, we just hate America. People are hating on America. You are free to be here today. There is a freedom that exists around you that says that you're allowed to come and worship the God that you decide that you want to worship. And so as people who are blessed to live in a place where there's freedom of religion and worship, we tend to think that the church is just some sort of commodity. It's a place where, well, if I invest my time and, and I give some money, I should get something back. I should get a good word from the pastor. I, I, should, I should get to know him. I should have his number. I, I should have a good kids ministry that checks all the dots. You know what I'm saying? I should have music that reaches the correct decibel limits for my ears. And if not, I'll find a different church. And it's like, go find one. It's fine. We, we can't treat God's church like a convenience store where we go in and we just pick and take and pay our dues. That is not how scripture portrays Jesus's view of his church. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus tells Peter, he says, hey, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And then he follows it up with this statement, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what Jesus is insinuating in this is that the church is not a convenience store, right? It is a people being built for battle, that hell is against the church. 
And the truth is that you and I, we don't feel the global reality of what the church suffers every single day. And so it becomes so easy to fight for our wants. And I get baptized when I want to get baptized. And we forget to fight against the hell that's warring against the church. So, so Christian Freedom International is an organization that uh, kind of runs a bunch of stats on the church. And it says, uh, they say today more than 200 million followers of Jesus face persecution in over 100 countries. That 80% of all global acts of religious terrorism and discrimination are against Christians. That every five minutes, okay, every five minutes, someone outside of America is presented With this reality, okay? Deny Christ or die. And one of the signifying things that they have not, that they are unwilling to denounce Christ is their baptism. There have been stories of people choosing to be baptized and in coming out of the the waters, right? Usually it's not a tank because, but in coming out of the waters of a lake or an ocean, or a, or a river somewhere, immediately persecuted to their own death. Uh, I read a story in the Christian Post a few years uh, back, and I saved it because it was just wild. And uh, there was a group of Christians in Syria who were caught by ISIS after they started nine new house churches. Um, and they were caught because they were performing baptisms. And uh, the baptisms were the signal that these people were being identified with Jesus which was illegal in their nation. And the militant leaders identified uh, the, the leader as a 41-year-old pastor and uh, found out that he also had a 12-year-old son uh, who was a part of the group. And so the Islamic extremists began to uh, throw punches, hurl punches at a 12-year-old boy, telling a 12-year-old boy to renounce Jesus when he would not succumb to their, their, their beatings um, they threatened to cut his fingers off, to which they did one by one, with the father watching and the son telling the father not to denounce his faith. And the father choosing to not denounce his faith, even though they were given the opportunity to have their freedoms if they would just deny Christ and convert to Islam. And after they refused their allegiance, refused to announce their allegiance to Jesus, right? The two of them were crucified in front of a crowd on a cross, and it took two days for them to die. And we, and, and we come here today, fill in the room, and I think it is great that we're here, thinking that Christianity is some sort of game that we play, if we just wear the right outfit and say the right words, you know, and do the right things, like we're, we're, we're all good. And it's like, do you understand? Jesus said, in this world, you have trials and tribulations and you are called to suffer for my name. Now, why? Why would a 40, 41-year-old dad and a 12-year-old boy be willing to endure such horrors? It's because they understood something that we fail to get oftentimes. That the purpose of this life isn't just to arrive at death safely. Like beyond your death, if it really is true that Jesus is an eternal God who saves us for eternity, then in a billion years from now, you'll still be somewhere doing something with him. Amen. And they understood that. They understood the power of Jesus' words when he says in Matthew chapter 10, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And that everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. So so after his resurrection, Jesus spends about 40 days with his followers and and then ascends to heaven. But before he leaves, he tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit who will come to them. And and one day they are gathered together and they're waiting on the Lord. And and this is what happens. This is in Acts chapter 2, okay? It's it's called the, the day of Pentecost. So when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there was from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house that they were sitting in. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit began to give them utterance. 
It says, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, at this, this noise that they hear, they, the multitude came and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And, and so basically, like there's these, all these different ethnicities around and actually 17 to be exact that we see in the scriptures. And there's this representation of all these different people and they're hearing the message of Jesus as Peter gets up and proclaims the very first Christian message ever to tell the world about Jesus, right? And they're all understanding it in their native dialect. And, and it was awesome because it was the beginning of this movement that was called the way. We weren't originally called Christians. It was called the way because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody gets to the Father but by me. And it was this demonstration that this way is a multinational, multi-ethnic, multicultural movement for all. And so then Peter sees that people from different languages are understanding what is being said, and he takes advantage of the moment, and he preaches the very first Christian message ever. And he closes out his message with these words. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 36. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified because of your sin, and some of you actually had lawless hands that actually hurt him. God has made this Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, verse 37 says, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Like, what do we do? You have to understand the message of Jesus forces a response. And so Peter says to them this, don't have sex before your marriage. Make sure you don't get drunk. He didn't do that. He says, repent, which means turn to Jesus and be baptized. Make a public declaration of where your allegiance is. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them. And verse 41 says, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So, So the message of Jesus forces a response. Okay? Like, like, if it is true that a guy really lived, claimed to be God, claimed to be the bread of life, the resurrection and the life, the, the, the living water, if you, if you come to me, you'll never thirst again. Like, if, if, if he really is the way, the truth, and the life, nobody gets to the Father but by him. If this is real, right, and this is true, then it forces a response. To not respond is a response. To, the, to, to just consider is a response. To contemplate, oh, do I really believe it, is a response. To sit in your seat is a response. To move forward and, and say my allegiance to him is a response. The message of Jesus forces a response. And for those who believe, and, and don't even know, like if we're honest, you're like, I don't even know why. Like, I wish I could tell you all the reasons why I believe. I wish it was because all of my questions were answered. I wish it was because, like, I, I, just, I just wish I knew. I don't know why that day when Ricky Grant explained the message of Jesus to me, I was just like, yes. Yeah. And, and it's, it's for those who believe, Peter, the very first message is, now you got to make a personal, a, a, a public declaration of this, that you're in this family. You're with us. And that day, those who received the word were baptized. And that day there was added about 3,000 souls. So baptism, you have to understand, baptism, it's not an emotional thing. It doesn't take faith to get baptized. <laughs> it's a decision to be obedient to what Jesus says. It's deciding to say I do publicly, not behind the closed door, like the guy who's like, oh, I love you. You know, just don't tell anybody. You know, that's what... What? Baptism is a personal, cognitive, deliberate decision that a person makes for themselves, not because mom and dad told me to do it, not because I grew up in the church, not because my dad is a pastor or my mom is, you know, none of that matters. You're never, it's not because you're good enough. I'm good enough now to get baptized. It's because the enemy had come to steal, kill, and destroy your life. But Jesus came to bring you life and bring it abundant life to you. And you receive that. 
It's this picture of a fresh start. It's this picture of a new you, right? It's this declaration that I'm no longer one foot in, one foot out. I'm all in. I'm fully submerged. I'm completely cleansed. Not because I'm great, because God is so great and his blood has covered me. Okay? So, so in Acts chapter 8, Philip, a guy by the name of Philip, finds this eunuch, okay, reading the Old Testament, but the guy doesn't understand it. He's reading the book of Isaiah. Has anybody ever read the Bible and been like, Man, I don't really fully get it? Okay, at least we can... Re- Some of you were like, no, I understand it completely. Can we just all own it? Sometimes you read it, you're like, I need a commentary or something. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So Philip fi- sees this dude, and, and he's reading the Bible, and he's like, I don't really understand it. And so Philip comes over, and he helps him understand it. And it says this in Acts chapter 8. It says, Philip opened his mouth and began... I love, I love how like literal they are. They're like, I want you to know that he wasn't speaking subliminally. He opened his mouth. Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him about Jesus. This is Jesus. This is all pointing to Jesus. Yeah, the suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 53, that's pointing to Jesus. The one who was crucified, that was hung on a tree, pointing to Jesus. By his wounds you are healed, pointing to Jesus. Like, so he just opens up his eyes. Like, he helps them see how the Old Testament points to Jesus. And it says in verse 36, And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch says to him, Hey, see here? Here's some water. And then he asks this question, What prevents me from being baptized what prevents me from being baptized i think that's a great question and philip's probably like ragging his brain he's like oh man like i remember peter talking like repent and be baptized like, yeah yeah you're right you, what prevents you from being baptized no, what prevents you from being baptized and he commanded peter commanded the chariot to stop and they went down to the water and philip baptized him there and so i will pose to you this same question what prevents you my allegiance is to Jesus. I, 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 like I said, I do. I'm taken. I belong to him. I'm redeemed. Like, like I, I don't have all my questions answered, but something inside of me, something's like, yes, yes, Lord. Like, like I do believe that before I was even formed in my mother's womb, like he had already set me apart. I don't know why I believe this to be true. Like, but I believe that God has used even my history and my past and my pain, like, and he's producing something new in me. And I believe that God has saved me from my sin and my hope is in him. Yes, that's me. The what? What, what in the world <laughs> would prevent you from being baptized? So I'll give you some answers because I've been doing this a long time now, right? Well, I'm not mature enough. Correct. You're not. <laughs> Correct. If you've ever, like, if, those of us who are married in the room, we know, we, we look back at our wedding day. Beth and I laugh about this all the time. We're like, we accidentally got lucky. Like, we, it wasn't like we were ready. Like, we, we weren't mature enough. I was 20. And let me tell you, some of you are getting married nowadays in your 30s. You ain't mature enough. I know you. I do your premarital. Okay? You ain't mature enough. You don't know how to share a feeling if your life depended on it. Okay? You ain't mature, okay? Baptism isn't about I'm mature enough. It's prideful to think that you'd ever be mature enough for Jesus. No, it's your immaturity that needs to be covered by his grace, right? Oh, I'm I'm just not clean enough. I'm not clean enough. Uh, I'm just, you know, understand the things that I've done. I've done some things, really. (laughs) Oh, poor you. I've been through some stuff, man. Yeah, you know what? It's kind of arrogant to think that your sin is bigger than the significance and size of the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay? I know, like, I know, I know you want me to sympathize with you. Oh, you've been through. Yeah, we have all been through stuff. Okay? We've all been through stuff. His cross and what he accomplished is greater than the stuff we've been through. How about this? I was, I was baptized and sprinkled as a kid. Well, that's great. That's great. What was that like for you? I don't remember. You know, I was like, I got pictures, or at least they told me I have, like, wouldn't it be nice to not have an arranged marriage and to have a marriage that you decided that you wanted to give your allegiance to a person? Can can we just, oh, I was sprinkled. Don't let somebody else make an eternal decision for you. You make it for yourself. 
Don't let somebody else force you to declare something that you yourself don't necessarily want to declare. Now, let's, I, I'm not against sprinkling, okay? Like, I know I got some Presbyterian people in the house that's like, we sprinkle, that's what we do. Praise God for that. You're dedicating them kids and giving those kids to the Lord. And like, if you want that to count later, that's great. I'm just a big believer in, I think there's a power associated with an adult or a young adult even, or even a child that's come to the conclusion, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus, saying to the world and to others, my allegiance is to Christ. I just feel like there's, there's something with that. Oh, how about this? Oh, okay, this is good. This is good, Pastor. I'll pray about this. I'll pray. You just, you just going to pray about being obedient? You just, what do you think the answer is going to be? <laughs> That's the dumbest. Okay. And then this is another one. This, is my, this one is probably my favorite. I've only gotten this a few times. People are like, well, I'm not sure I want to be identified with Netcast Church. <laughs> you act like we want to be identified with you. <laughs> you act like I'm, I'm, I might, we, mm-mm. We might be like, mm, now that you have the tank, you could go. <laughs> Just, that's okay, and that's an okay thing. This church isn't for, ev- I mean, we're for everybody, but it's like, th- this might not be your place, and that's Okay. That's fine. But what you do need to do is be identified with Jesus. Okay? So, so what prevents a person from being baptized? I don't know. Pride? Arrogance? Fear? Like, the crowd? No. To not be baptized is to not identify with Jesus. Again, which is okay if you don't identify with Jesus, but just don't walk around telling your people that you identify with Jesus. All right? So um, some of you are like, well, I don't, uh, okay, all right, cool, but I don't have shorts. We got shorts in the back where you're good. Uh, I, and a shirt, yeah, you get one of these too. All right, oh, but my hair, da, da, da. we got brushes in the back, okay? W- where do I get changed? I can't, we have places for you to get changed in the back, right? We have towels, we, you know, I get ashy, I need some, lo- we got lotion for you, right? Some of the ladies are like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. My, I, nowadays it's like the, um, the big eyelashes, you know, it's like a thing. It's like, no, eyelashes are gonna come out, it's like, girl, Oh, well, you know what I'm saying? You were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of Jesus. You're his masterpiece with or without your eyelashes, okay? Okay. Uh, what about, oh, what about my undies? We have girl undies and boy undies in the back, okay? They're not sexy, I can promise you that, but they're back there. Uh, hygiene products, yes, we have, we, we are, if it's that period of the month, we're ready for you, Okay. <laughs> And if your family's not here, cool, it's okay, right? We're going to be taking pictures. The whole thing's going to be put on, on film. And it's, it's a great celebration because it ought to be. And so um, I want to invite you today, if you are a believer in Jesus, I know you, a lot of you, we have some people that have planned to be baptized, but a lot of you didn't plan to be baptized today. Cool. But you should still do it, okay? You should still do it. We have a group of people that's going to get ready to receive you, make sure that you have your size and all that stuff. Like, we're, we're ready for you. Okay, so why don't we stand together? Why don't we stand? All right, I'm going to do like the old school one, two, three thing. If, if, if you're going to get baptized, you don't have to go yet. Just I'm going to do the one, two, three thing because I don't know. I like that. I like the one, two, three thing. Okay. Some of you came here today just to come to church and God is stirring you to be baptized and identify with him. Um. Today's your day to make a public declaration. Hey, my allegiance is to Jesus. And so I'm going to count to three. And if God's called you to be baptized today because you're a faithful believer, you're a believer in Christ, I want you to come forward through those doors over there and make this a day that you and I together will never forget. So, all right, you ready? One, if you're a believer, you better come forward if you ain't been baptized yet. Two, Jesus says, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. That's two. Three, if you decide to get baptized, come forward right now. Make your way through those doors while the rest of us clap. Come on. Come on. Hey, hey. Come on, baby.
the Bible says all of heaven rejoices when one sinner comes to a place of repentance, okay? And that heaven's like a huge party. It's this huge party where we, as the people of God, and those saints who are before us, right, are in heaven. And it's like we're all rejoicing together with heaven even right now of like the family of God growing. And so let's worship the mess out of our Jesus because he loves us and he's for us. He's not against us. And let's celebrate new life today. All right? I love you. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, email info at netcastchurch.org. We'll see you next time.